Well, good afternoon, and thank you for participating in today's discussion on managing risk and building resilience during a pandemic. The word unprecedented has been routinely used to describe the past few months as the world has faced the challenges presented by COVID-19. While this certainly is not the first pandemic societies have ever faced, it has been one of the most challenging events most of us have witnessed. A principal concern now is how to best navigate the risk of restarting our economy, how we safely and successfully emerge from stay-at-home orders amid the continued transmission will be vital in reinvigorating consumer demand and business operations. To date, the COVID response has largely been locally executed, state managed, and federally supported, which has left businesses with a variety of operating environments. This diverse landscape will require organizations to develop their own tailored enterprise risk management strategies for returning to work safely and effectively. To talk through these issues today, we have two of our nation's most esteemed security professionals, former Department of Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff and former Acting Commissioner of Customs Border Protection, Jay Ahern. As you likely know, Secretary Chertoff led the Department of Homeland Security from 2005 to 2009, where he oversaw the federal government's efforts to protect our nation from a wide range of safety and security risks, including development of the department's first ever pandemic contingency response plan. Prior to serving as the secretary, he was a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the third district. Following his time leading the department, Secretary Chertoff founded the Chertoff Group for the express purpose of helping organizations best manage safety and security risks, including pandemics. Today, Secretary Chertoff provides high-level strategic counsel to corporate and government leaders on a broad range of enterprise risk management and security-related investment decisions. We are also pleased to have Jay Ahern with us today, a 33-year law enforcement professional and served as CBP's Deputy Commissioner before being named Acting Commissioner. While overseeing CBP, Jay led nearly 60,000 employees in protecting the nation's borders from the various actors, while also facilitating international trade and travel. Today, Jay is a principal at the Chertoff Group and leads the Security Advisory Services Practice. As a practice lead, Jay is keenly aware of the security risks that businesses face around the world. He is sought out by global clients for his insights on how to effectively manage safety and security risks in business operations. In summary, we would be hard pressed to find two more devoted public servants who have led through some of our nation's most pressing security issues over the last 20 years. And today we hope to share some of that experience to help inform your organizational approaches to the current pandemic crisis. Before getting started, I want to give you a quick overview of our discussion today. We have some questions prepared to facilitate our dialogue with the Secretary and Commissioner, and we will also be collecting questions from you. If your questions are specific to the topic at hand, we'll certainly try to wrap them in to keep this as interactive as possible. Otherwise, we'll set aside some time at the end to cover your questions. In terms of sending questions, you can send them at any point. To ask a question, go to your control panel on the right side of the screen. If you don't see the control panel, it may be collapsed, so look for the orange arrow to expand it. The question tool is at the bottom of the control panel. When you send us a question, it will only be visible to us. With that in hand, let's begin our conversation. And we'll start with you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you've obviously seen a number of contingencies over the years and personally led the department uh, through several of them. Uh, the situation over the past several months has been incredibly dynamic. Uh, and looking back, what are, your, some, what are some of your initial observations? What are things maybe we could have done better to position ourselves? Well, let me say first, this is uh, unquestionably in my lifetime the most significant global disruption that we've seen. 9-11 um, was obviously a terrible event. We've had earthquakes, <clears throat> we've had fires, we've had hurricanes, but they have not been global in impact. They've been regional. They may have had reverberations in other parts of the world. But in terms of the actual direct effects, they were more or less felt in a, one or two states. This is something that really affects all 50 states and almost every country in the world. And that means that it, it is much more challenging to mobilize the resources you need to deal with it because you get a certain amount of competition. It's also among the most persistent of these kinds of disruptive events we've seen. 
a hurricane, you know, may have uh, lasting effects, but the storm itself lasts for a matter of days. Here we have the constant threat of a resurgence of the virus, so that there's no sense that we've ended it and we're on the downslope. Rather, we're not sure. We're trying to manage it down, but again, there's no guarantee, particularly until we get the vaccine. So in terms of what we might have done earlier, um, I'd say there are two things that come to mind. One is, of course, uh, pulling the alert button or pushing the alert button earlier would have allowed us to do testing and contact tracing uh, at an early stage. It might have abated community spread. In the past, things like SARS and MERS did not actually become global because there was early action taken to identify people who were sick and prevent them from moving around and spreading. Now, in fairness, this was more difficult because people can spread even when they're not symptomatic. When you're dealing with something like Ebola, by the time you're a spreader, you're probably so sick you don't feel like going anyplace. Here you have people walking around for days, maybe even weeks, not feeling any symptoms, but, but shedding the virus, and that made it much more difficult. The second thing, of course, is we didn't have stockpiled enough testing, enough protective medical equipment, uh, enough ventilators. And so we've had to go on a desperate hunt for these resources. And that has also slowed up our response. And it really underscores the importance of preparation and planning and equipping in advance of an event <clears throat> if you're going to have any hope of managing it effectively. That's great, sir. I appreciate that. And, um, and Commissioner, you know, you've worked a lot, you know, with uh, clients, you know, all over uh, internationally and domestically. Along those same lines, what are some of your initial observations from working with those clients and, and kind of things you've heard? I, thanks, Aaron. I think some of the things to complement what the Secretary said and what we're seeing with a lot of the activity we've been dealing with as this pandemic came upon us very quickly is to me it's so striking how small the world has actually become over the years when you take a look at transportation networks supply chains being as compressed as they are uh, it really is has been an aggravating factor in this circumstance when you're dealing with a pandemic as you're trying to go ahead and add efficiency just in time inventory things of that nature uh, which also is a very positive thing from a security and risk mitigation measure in this set of circumstances it's actually going ahead and become an aggravating factor I saw a, a, a kind of a timeline going back to what it was like in Wuhan when you tried to travel by road to, to Beijing or to Shanghai years ago, and not that many years ago, in fact, and how many days it would take to get there. And now when you have air travel to be able to get from Wuhan, which was the identified origin of the virus, how quickly you can get to Shanghai or Beijing, two major international gateways, and how quickly you can then be a different gateway locations around the world just shows how quickly something like this actually can spread. So people started to believe this is just a problem began in China, it would stay there in China, or ended up in Rome very quickly. I think one of the things that I see with a lot of clients we engage with, they didn't open up their own risk management aperture quickly enough to see that this is something that could impact them. And when you're dealing with a pandemic and a response like this, any significant global risk, the preparation and the planning and the beginning of the response is one of the most essential components you can have to try to mitigate some of the impact of a risk that we're facing today. And we've seen on some of the news in the last 24, 48 hours that had there been even a week or two earlier response, that might have saved some additional number of lives. We'll let the health experts and those who do the analytical work, you know, debate those issues. But I do believe from just a practitioner standpoint, those are essential components. And oftentimes what we find is I mean, we're, we were guilty of this when we were office, in office back in government. You're dealing with the threats that are facing you right now. You're dealing with the emergent business challenges. You're dealing with the financial and budgetary challenges you have to run an organization. And you take a look at some of these things and you take a look at the, at the risk likelihood of something like this happening and say, you know what, I've got time to focus on that. And unfortunately, we oftentimes don't circle back on those things. And I think that might be a circumstance here as we're seeing from many businesses that might have been caught a little bit off guard and tried to put their plans and begin to implement those perhaps a little bit late. Uh, thanks, Jay, that's great. And I think we'll come back to some of those themes you picked up, especially relative to supply chain here shortly. Um, 
But the idea that year over year preparing for these contingencies remains such an important part of what we do. If you plan for it, you can generally be ready for it. I think that's an important theme you laid out there. Um, and Mr. Secretary, going back to you, um, you know, you mentioned the entire international community is dealing with this issue. And, and uh, the international community right now is also dealing with how to reopen. Uh, we've seen a variety of ways in which people have done that. Um, are there consistent principles or thresholds that we should be looking at to reopen? Um, and I'll come to you, Commissioner, with some specificity on that as well. Well, generally what we're looking for is a reduction in the number of new cases indicating that the spreading is beginning to decline, at least the community spreading, coupled with wanting to make sure that we are keeping the number of cases below the maximum capacity of our hospitals to deal with the virus and then other things which also continue to be uh, emergency issues. Uh, the really worst case scenario is if the cases spike up and you actually exceed your hospital capacity and then people die because there aren't enough beds. So what we're looking for is consistent decrease, which suggests that the spreading is diminishing and that the social distancing is working. And then we want to gradually allow more interaction, provided people still follow the rules about keeping distance, sanitation, wearing masks in many places, and also dealing with issues like ventilation and spacing so that you actually reduce the ability of the virus to transmit. And Commissioner, your thoughts? I, I think a, a couple of themes here that are, are critical is uh, oftentimes if you look at the high level numbers, we listen to what the, the news and the networks and the 24 hours news cycle are telling us. And a lot of those are, are certainly good data elements that are provided by very you know, significant academic and health institutions like you know, the CDC and certainly you know, John Hopkins University. They're very reliable with the data. But that's in the aggregate, and I've learned many things over the years, but one of the things that sticks with you most is you gotta break that data down and actually get down to the fundamental points that actually impact where you are. Because when you're looking at high level numbers, they can be very alarming. And certainly when you take a look at the number of impacted and infected cases we've had in the United States and globally, and the significant amount of deaths, those are very much alarming. But I think to make good decisions, you need to break that down to its lowest common denominator and take a look in the community or in the part of the business world that you're actually operating to make the most informed decisions you can versus being perhaps alarmed by numbers when you look at them in the aggregate. I think as you take a look at some of those things, you know, the, the constant tension we're seeing today amongst the, the people both in government, even within government, people that are trying to make the decisions based on what's the right thing for the economy versus the health professionals and their advice to the administration. And then the cascade effect that has down to communities throughout the country it's that tension that needs to be resolved on how do you make the most informed decisions in a much more specific location based on data specific information. What are the capabilities also? And that's one of the things for businesses. What are the capabilities they have for actually putting what we hear repeatedly, the three most fundamental things to help keep this pandemic at bay is good PPE and consistent use of it. Hygiene, making sure you wash, wash, wash and do those things and social distancing. So how do you put those three key elements in place to an overall comprehensive plan so you can get the, the economy restarted, get people to begin to socialize in a safe and effective way, but also try to move forward smartly so we don't end up really complicating the problem that we're already dealing with? No, that's great, Commissioner. And I, I'd like to pull on a couple threads that both of you brought up. Um, Mr. Secretary, you highlighted kind of some steps we need to take and the decreasing caseload over time that social distancing is work uh, is working, um, especially for customer facing businesses, those that have to interact with customers. Um, you know, it, it would make sense over time that social distancing is working and that we see a drop in cases. But as we open back up and those businesses that have customers that they need to interface with, what are the best practices or things that you think they can do to, bet, to manage that risk going forward? We obviously can't eliminate the risk, but what kinds of things can they do, which touches on some of the themes that uh, the commissioner was hitting on? Well, one of the things we're seeing uh, you know, here in the district, and we just uh, on uh, a video uh, presentation 
the mayor based on recommendations that we had, at the uh, reopen DC committee had made to her. As we're talking about things like uh, capacity limitations in, in retail establishment, you know, gating or metering the number of people who enter a very crowded situation. Uh, certainly in the supermarkets and grocery stores, we've seen plexiglass between the uh, people working at the checkout count and the customers. Um, you know, regular uh, sanitation and sweeping, uh, insistence upon wearing masks, um, using payment methods that don't or minimize the exchange of cash, things that really reduce touching and closeness without impairing the fundamental function of the retail establishment. That's great, sir. And, you know, we're kind of touching on it right now to some degree, but as uh, we move towards, uh, you know, reopening, if you will, what kind of headwinds are you anticipating? You know, what, uh, what do we expect businesses to face? What kinds of things could we imagine over the course of the next month or two uh, as we do gradually reopen? Well, you, you know, you had some stories in the paper about people who refuse to wear masks or get angry if there are limitations on how quickly they enter a store. Or in some supermarkets, for example, they have um, direction arrows. So you, people go down an aisle in the same direction. Some people don't want to do that. I mean, people who just, as a matter of, of their ideology or simply out of convenience, don't want to play by the rules. Of course, in doing that, they're not only assuming the risk for themselves, but they're assuming the risk on other people as well. So I think managing um, these requirements in a way that is explainable to customers, that is, you know, firm but fair and not overbearing, um, and that uh, tries to make things as convenient as possible is how you tamp down on the possibility of people, um, you know, bridling at this. I'd also like to remind people of another thing, though. If you don't demonstrate that you're taking care of these issues, you may find that people deliberately don't come to your store. Um, you know, one of the drawing points on restaurants may well be that they're conducting themselves, even when they are allowed to open up, with adequate spacing among tables, uh, paper menus as opposed to using the same menu with different people, uh, no sharing of communal um, items like, uh, you know, ketchup and, and, and mustard, but rather individual um, uh, portion controlled uh, condiments, things like that that give most customers the perception that in fact the establishment is taking care to minimize the risk. Yeah, you hit on a couple of key points there, sir, that, uh, you know, maybe Commissioner, you can bring out as well. One of the issues and fundamental issues uh, that the Secretary was talking about is kind of reestablishing trust, uh, whether that be with employees or whether that be customers. Like, how do you engender trust that people are confident that when they go to work or a customer wants to engage a, a storefront, uh, that there's, uh, you know, something in place uh, for them to do that? What kinds of things um, have you heard, risk indicators, uh, you know, indicating a level of trust, things that people can do to, uh, move forward in that regard. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that are going to be very important going forward, I think you need to take in two or three key factors. One is kind of the social behavior, uh, individuals, how they're going to react and respond to some of these things. And also from a, a business standpoint, how do you strike the right balance? But I think it goes into the theme of, of change management, uh, change management in one's lives, change management in one's behavior when you're out in the public, and also in the business environment, how do you change your business process, access to a facility, to a manufacturing location? What are the measures you have in place to audit and, and enforce some of the rules and regulations and policies that are gonna be put in place? Those are gonna be some of the challenges going forward. I think putting together a plan, which is a fundamental point that certainly all businesses and industries should be doing, just like we've seen at the federal level, state level, down to the local levels, but even now carry that out into individual business premises. We've seen a lot of companies put in some solid business plans, but we've all seen over the years, too, that plans are one aspect of it. The implementation of those plans and the oversight and the auditing of those plans becomes paramount for, paramount for success over time. Because what we've seen over the years, you implement a new policy, you implement a new procedure, you put it in place, you make everybody sign and receive for it, and then say, 
you're all going to follow this, right? And you see this nodding head saying, yes, we will do that. And what's the first thing that happens? Human behavior gets involved. Some of the social elements get involved. And all of a sudden, the strategy starts to unravel. And that's going to be one of the big challenges I think a lot of businesses are going to have and industries are going to have, and certainly governments at the state and local level more so than at the federal level. How do you maintain the enforceability of this over time? Because people's tolerance, I think, has been eroded over the last nine, 10 weeks. I think people realize the right thing was to stay quarantined, stay out of the public eye, the social distancing. But people are very restless now. And you're going to see some of these things as people start to go ahead and get a little bit more latitude to get out and socially engage. How do you make sure that they maintain the right level of personal and social discipline to make sure that all of a sudden this doesn't add to already set up complicating factors going forward? And the same thing in businesses. They're going to have to have the, the ability to over audit and oversee the procedures. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I, you know, you've touched on uh, the fact that, you know, things have fundamentally changed for businesses going forward. Um, and I'd like to touch on maybe those industries that are more acutely impacted by this. You know, we think of the airlines, we think of retail, we think of the entertainment industry, casino gaming. Um, how should business leaders, you know, acutely affected in those areas navigate this risk landscape going forward? And, and Mr. Secretary, I'd like your thoughts on, you know, those that have suffered the most, if you will, what kinds of things uh, should they be thinking about to restart? And, you know, the one that most obvious comes to mind is kind of the aviation ecosystem. Well, I, th I think some businesses that are suffering will have to uh, take the opportunity to adjust their business model. For example, if we go to retail or even restaurants, you may see greater emphasis on home delivery, on takeout, on outdoor dining, things of that sort. Um, aviation is more challenging, to be honest, because you're dealing with two distinct sets of issues. One is this being on the airplane itself. And how do people feel about the uh, um, contagiousness? <clears throat> you know, what are the changes in configuration? What are the changes in level of service um, that will make the flying experience different? And it may also become more expensive as you decrease the volume of people that fly, and as there are fewer in a plane, fares are going to go up. A separate and distinct issue is travel restrictions. Now, that's not that much of an issue within the U.S. for domestic travel, but it may be a while before international travel is unfettered. And that may be mean there may be travel restrictions to and from some places. There may be requirements that you have temperature testing or other kinds of testing before you're allowed to enter a country. In some countries, they're talking about requiring you to be quarantined for 14 days after you arrive, which is a kind of a discouraging um, vision for business travelers. And until these things resolve themselves and get a uniform standard, I think you're gonna see international travel become much curtailed. And that again will have an impact on fares, on service, <clears throat> on the way airports are configured. Um, I know you know the TSA is now looking at uh, how its operations are going to be affected by these changes. So those will be a more long-lasting and profound uh, impact. That's great, Mr. Secretary. And I, I'd like to bridge over to the Commissioner on that theme of uh, international travel and some of the technology implementation that folks have talked about, medical passports, uh, you know, temperature checks and how between the commercial industry and government that interaction could occur going forward and facilitate the restart of inter international travel. Commissioner? Yeah, no, I, it's going to be a challenging point. It's not that one that's not been dealt with in the past on different things. We certainly saw this after 9-11. How do you ensure security, but also expedite legitimate travel and trade and the flow of people in a way that you can go ahead and not stifle and negatively impact uh, travel and trade. But I think one of the things going forward, uh, there's a lot of talk about different types of technology and how that's going to be introduced into the process. And as we've all seen over the years, sometimes the introduction of technology, uh, people feel that's going to help the process. It oftentimes comes with an awful lot of consequences you may not factor through. Uh, some of these thermal imaging devices, they really need to be thought through of how well do they work. How does it fit into the overall concept of operations? What is it going to mean to the overall footprint of a location? What's it going to mean for throughput and capacity? 
what's the capitalized investment it takes to go ahead and buy these items? And then also, what's your response protocol when something happens? And how do you deal with that circumstance when you have somebody that's on the margin of, of perhaps being a temperature that's over the threshold? Are you gonna say flat out, you're not gonna get on a plane or you're not gonna be able to travel internationally? I think these are some of the gonna be the challenges of what government agencies here in the US and overseas are gonna be grappling with because we've seen these in the past when you put together a lot of these policies and procedures, be really ready to deal with the consequences when you put them into play. And then lastly, as you start to introduce more technology, when you look to go ahead and, and connectivity of that technology is gonna be key and that's gonna go under the microscope. You're gonna be taking a look at privacy as we did with body imaging devices over the years, who's seeing images, how's it being stored, who else can access it. Now you're gonna have an additional personal element that's gonna be potentially gathered. I think all these things are gonna be real big challenges for, for the government going forward. And I remember Secretary and I had a conversation we were both working we started to go ahead and collect uh, information off people's mobile devices and personal devices. Not that you don't have the authority to do it, but you better make sure you have solid procedures in place and procedures that can be audited because you can lose that authority very quickly after the fact if it's not done correctly. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Commissioner, and it's probably a good opportunity to discuss a little bit more about privacy. You know, that was front of mind long before COVID-19, especially when we talk about biometrically enabled, you know, uh, practices that uh, we're talking about, whether it be government and uh, TSA checkpoints or CBP or others that are enabling uh, technology with biometrics, but also the facilitation aspects that industry is very interested in. And looking ahead over the next few months, we've heard a lot about contact tracing, uh, antibody tests. Um, all the things that we're talking about that might be crucial and foundational going forward until we get an, a vaccine. What kind of privacy issues do you see, Mr. Secretary, related to that? How are we going to get through uh, the HIPAA concerns and everything else that we're facing uh, in these kind of dialogues? Well, so Aaron, as you point out, I mean, one of the you know issues which has been around for a while is HIPAA. It's your health privacy. It's whoever collects health data has an obligation to secure it and keep it private. But one of the interesting things is you get into contact tracing and epidemiology is the use of your mobile device as a tool. It could be a very useful tool. A couple of companies are now dealing with putting together a platform on your phone that can be used to host apps that would record Bluetooth contacts with any other phone that you come to, that's possessed by someone you come to close contact with. And if you became ill, you would then have the option of pressing a button and the app without disclosing your identity would inform the people you had been in touch with over the last, let's say, 14 days that they might have been in the presence of a person who was sick and they ought to get tested. Now that sounds like a good issue and inherently one that because of, and, uh, the uh, anonymization doesn't really raise privacy issues, but inevitably there'll be a desire to collect the data, to aggregate it, to see where there may be hot spots. Those are legitimate things, but then they start to raise the specter about whether the government is going to be mapping your associations for other purposes, like for example in China. In China they have a very robust system for tracking every place you go and everybody you deal with. Um, it helps them manage the epidemic, but it also helps them manage away your freedom. So I think, you know, building a set of rules and gates in these new technologies will be critical to have them accepted widely by the public, which will be necessary if these are going to be effective. Now, that's great, Mr. Secretary. That, that hits right on the idea. I was going to raise that point about, you know, surveillance, if you will, and, and how that might be perceived going forward from the public. Um, you know, just to kind of go back a little bit to the, uh, the restart itself, um, there's a couple issues I wanted to ask you about, Commissioner, is, you know, what do you see as the, the second and third order implications here? You know, we've got a lot of people working from home. You know, cybersecurity seems to be almost a different ball game at this point with uh, so many decentralized nodes, if you will, out there. Um, we've got the concerns, and, and I know, Mr. Secretary, you've talked briefly about China 
uh, in some of the supply chain issues related to China and concerns there. Um, you know, we've also seen, and we may see more of it, a little bit of, you know, violence, right? Is either people are disenfranchised uh, or, you know, the, the dynamic itself of so many people staying at home, uh, the tension rising. We've seen a number of things happen there. What kinds of things are you seeing and, and hearing about that concern you most? Three things I think that are they're important. You know, what's going to be the behavior change for for businesses going forward, and how is it going to change with travel and security of people in their travel, whether it be in the United States or elsewhere? Access to facilities, whether it be an office building or whether it be a manufacturing site, and how do you again go ahead and put the right level of policies, procedures, and protocols in place, and to make sure that they again can be audited? But then also taking a look at the outliers. I mean, we've all seen some of these. YouTube uh, episodes out there with people defying to wear masks and really trying to be drawing the attention upon themselves and, and being a YouTube sensation. But they're really just drawing away from the severity and the seriousness of the issue. But how do you go ahead and really take a look at some of the things that could be disruptive? We've seen a lot of pretty aggressive protests of people saying the government is really stepping all over my rights by telling me I have to stay at home. Is that something where the government has overstepped their authority? We've seen that manifest in protests in Washington and in state capitals in many states throughout the United States. <clears throat> we have the recent shooting that just happened in the last 24 hours in Arizona. We don't know what the circumstances are of that yet, but it'll be interesting to follow to see if there was anything that was triggered by some of the events that actually have been unfolding for the last several weeks. But I would be concerned if, if I'm a, a business owner that has not even necessarily a large campus, but certainly those that have a large campus provide themselves as a more, you know, attractive target for a protester and one who might want to be an aggressive actor. And certainly if you happen to be associated with a very iconic brand, that has traditionally been something that has been a target of protesters or terrorists uh, or people that are motivated by a variety of different negative facts. But making sure, again, that there's a good plan in place against all those aspects are important. And I go back to one of the things we talked about earlier. The planning is essential here to go ahead and mitigate some of the risks that can happen when an event does unfold. We talked about it in this particular pandemic. Had there been better planning and earlier imp implementation of the plan, you might have had a better result earlier and may not have had as much long-term sustained negative impact. But having plans going forward, and that's going to be really challenging for a lot of companies right now, particularly large ones, that are trying to manage today's challenge of how do I reopen and restart my business and put a plan in place for that. But guess what? You do have to do it all. The duty of care that an employer has has to be looking at all aspects that could neg negatively impact a company and bring a significant amount of liability. So you just can't focus on one issue. And, and Secretary and I know this from our time in, in organizations. You have to be an organization that's very nimble and can pivot from one threat and risk to another. The businesses have to do the same thing and have the appropriate level of planning for all the different threats that are facing us today. Yeah, uh, Commissioner, I think that's a great point about how we're so consumed by the virus itself and getting people back to work and all the mitigations that need to be put in place to do so. But there's all these tangential issues associated with that that leaders need to be prepared for inside their organization that's going to require a lot more thinking uh, going forward. And I, I think you've summarized a lot of that. The bottom line is you got to be thinking about a whole bunch more than just the virus itself and how you're going to manage it. Um, and Mr. Secretary, you touched on China briefly earlier. Um, there's been a lot of conversation on supply chain problems. Um, and certainly we've heard in the national dialogue questions relative to, you know, our relationship with China going forward. But I'd really like to just focus on supply chains uh, in this instance. What is your view given, you know, how much everything originates in China? What do we do about that going forward, not in the China sense, but in the diversification sense to make sure we're more robust and resilient going forward? Well, even before the pandemic, there was a, a really um, significant discussion about the national security implications of having critical infrastructure like 5G infrastructure, hardware and software being essentially provided sole source by Huawei, a Chinese company which has obviously, um, you know, a lot of control exerted by the Chinese government. 
and the concern that that could be used as a way of leveraging if there were a dispute of some kind. Now, the issue of the pandemic has overlaid a different distinct consideration, which is when you have a single source of supply, you have a single source of failure. And whether it's a pandemic or a, a, some big storm, a natural disaster, or even an outbreak of violence, that can affect uh, the ability of uh, a, a company that depends on a single source of supply to actually produce and do what it needs to do, particularly with essential goods. So what that means is we need to start creating alternative sources of supply and multiple sources of supply. And as Jay alluded to a little bit earlier, there's a sense that we've, in the last 20 years, operated with a hyper-efficient business model. Everything is minimal inventory, just-in-time delivery, all of which is designed to keep expenses down and profits up. That's great if everything is, is working well and it's a sunny day out. But when you hit a storm, all of a sudden you find yourself in, a, in having a problem. And I think this may change the business model so that resilience and redundancy become important elements in an overall business strategy. That's great, Mr. Secretary. And, and uh, along those lines, uh, Commissioner, um, you know, we have clients that you work closely with overseas. They may have manufacturing plants or, or whatnot. What kind of things are you seeing with them, uh, not just in the supply chain side, but in just managing their businesses overseas uh, in, in light of COVID? Well, I, I think it does go back to one of the points made right at the beginning, uh, that the world has become so small and you can basically get anywhere within a matter of 24 hours. And therefore, you can also have the virus move within 24 hours just as quickly. And I think a lot of companies are now taking a look at their business practices on particularly people that do have an awful lot of international travel for their employees, whether it be at the senior levels or at the sales levels or just essential functioning. And a lot of companies are now looking very closely at the, the travel practices of their, of their team. And I think what we've all learned over the last several weeks is that a lot can be accomplished through technology and through teleworking and through video conferencing and all the different capabilities that many of us have had to learn to use in the last few weeks. But you can find that there's an awful lot of efficiencies as a result of that. And I think a lot of companies are relooking right now at their travel security practices to find out, is it really worth the risk of putting somebody on a plane to send them to a far off location, put them then in a hotel for some number of days to then have them interact in another location, whether it be in a manufacturing site or a business location, would not knowing completely what are the, the, the practices that have been put in place during this pandemic, and then have them return back to home base. What does that mean as you complete that full circle? Is it potentially putting people that are at that home location at risk? So I think many of the companies that we're dealing with are taking a look at how do they do that, that differently? And I think that's gonna be a, a, an important factor many look at. The impact though, Aaron, as you brought up earlier, you know, we're trying to go ahead and also watch the airlines restart and get back underway. And I think just in the last 24 hours, I've seen a statistic that shows it, that bookings actually exceeded cancellations for the first time yesterday over the last three months. That's a positive trend, but that's certainly not a significant enough trend to be able to show that the airline industry is on a way to an economic recovery. It just shows there's not as many people canceling, but I think we're still, 10% of where we were a year ago at this point, which is up from five overall, but that's going to have to take a look because all these different aspects of our global economy are so inextricably linked together that we need to make sure that they're all vibrant and all working well. But I think those are going to be a few things that companies are looking at is their travel security practices. And, and also as far as many are starting to take a closer look to the point made earlier too about their campus or business security. How do you take a look to make sure that there's not a protester or a bad actor, an aggressive actor looking to create harm to the people in your employee that you're responsible for? And even now, a lot of things people look at, how do we introduce technology into just how people access my building, my facility, contactless type devices and technology so that people don't have to swipe a card, hit a keypad, those types of things. How do you introduce technology to make things efficient, but also in a very healthy way? Uh, 
That's great, Commissioner. I, I was um, in thinking about, you know, going forward, we've been talking a little bit about the global nature of, you know, this virus and the things that it's presented for us. A little bit more closer to home, you know, border security has been a, a, a significant topic for this administration. Let's talk a little bit about our partners to the north and south, Canada and Mexico. In terms of business operations and how we think about Canada and Mexico going forward, Mr. Secretary, what are your thoughts on what we need to do to try to get back open, if you will, uh, with our neighbors to the north and south? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, again, this is an issue about, uh, on the one hand, wanting to make sure we minimize the risk. But on the other hand, recognizing our business operations are very closely intertwined with Mexico and with Canada. And if for a protracted period of time, those borders remain shut to trade and to travel, that creates a real economic impact. And I think that's part of, frankly, what's contributing in certain parts of the country to the economic downturn. This is an area where, again, we have to be cooperative and coordinated. Um, one of the missed opportunities here is to have a national plan and a national set of standards that would enable us not only internally, but even with our immediate neighbors to have a common understanding of what needs to be done and to move up and down in terms of the degree of um, inhibition so that we do it in a way that's, that's minimally disruptive to our supply chains. And Jay knows this because we you know, do quite a bit of work uh, with companies with operations in Mexico that if we have interruptions at the border, um, that's going to be felt in the United States pretty profoundly. Hey, Commissioner, I know this is near and dear to your heart. Um, what are your views on this? Yeah, near and dear. I've just gotten out of therapy after being out of government for 10 years. So thanks for bringing it back up, though, Aaron. But I, I tell you what, what it brings in my head is what happened on 9-11, 9-12, and 9-13, 14, and 15, until we actually got our heads around how do we deal with the new risks and, and threats we were facing as a border agency of the country. Uh, we basically stifled the economy and international travel into the country because we didn't know where the threat was coming from. We didn't know if there was other threats still out there. And this is a different threat, certainly, but it's, it's still kind of, you're still boxing with a ghost, if you will. On, on where is it going to hit next? So what do you do in that kind of circumstance? If you don't have a good thoughtful plan, you just have to go ahead and react in a very inappropriate way. And that's just, let's just shut everything down until we can figure it out. That's not efficient. That's not effective. And it has devastating long-term impact. When we shut down the borders with Mexico, the economy came to a halt, not just for the travel back and forth, but when you take a look at the, the assembly operations and manufacturing op operations that have, in, they're, they're in place in Mexico and the same with Canada. You look at all the auto manufacturers in the Michigan area and the parts that come across from Canada. And again, those borders are only lines in the sand when you're looking at industry and, and supply chain security practices. I think one of the things the government put in place at the time, back in the days when there was customs under Treasury before Customs and Border Protection became under DHS, is you actually put together a supply chain security program so that if there was an event that ever happened again, you could at least go to a program that you had in place where you had a high level of confidence that companies had to use the highest degree of care and diligence to ensure their supply chain had a high level of integrity. I would call on the government to take a look at that program to see what they can do to build upon that, to add in the health and safety aspects for the handling of goods that would be crossing the border so that those can get front of the line, expeditious processing to make sure that those continue to streamline across borders and don't wait at all because the impact to the economy to get that engine restarted is so challenging and those need to continue to flow. So that would be some of the things that I would suggest and I've been reminiscing about some of that from the early days of 9-11 and 12. Absolutely, yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I wanna just kind of bridge into a couple of areas that um, you know are contingency related and then I think one near and dear to you, Mr. Secretary, but Let's talk about uh, hurricanes real quick. Uh, we almost had a scare, you know, recently on the East Coast. We're in the middle of this response. Hurricane season is upon us. Typically late in the summer, it heats up. Um, what kinds of things should, you know, we expect from the government relative to this? Is anything going to be different uh, in terms of what if you have to do an evacuation? Where do you send people? How do you manage that? And then what should businesses be thinking about along those lines? I mean, I imagine 
much of what we've learned now working from home applies to those scenarios, but what if people have to leave their homes? What are your thoughts on that, Mr. Secretary? Well, Mr. I think, again, it's about planning. Um, it's about stockpiling essential uh, supplies. If you did need to evacuate, <clears throat> where would you go? What would you need to bring with you? Um, the people in the, in the places that are usually afflicted, like in Florida, do tend to have things like shutters and, and things they can put up to protect the property. But unlike in a normal environment where you might evacuate to hotels or even to shelters, there may be some reluctance, uh, both on the part of the traveler and on the part of the establishment. And that's why, um, again, having uh, you know protective equipment, masks, and also figuring out where you would go that would be relatively safe is something that ought to be thought of in advance. Right now, there's a huge cyclone that's hit Bangladesh and India, and they're right in the middle of this, and, and it's compounding the problem. Absolutely. And Commissioner, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you, um, it goes back to a comment I made a little while ago about business leaders to make sure that they're able to handle multiple risks. And, and right now, the eye is on dealing with the pandemic, and who knows what the next risk will be tomorrow. And do and you take a look at DHS when it was, was founded? And I happen to be one of the first people involved with setting it up in the, the four and a half months we had from when the president signed the Homeland Security Act in November of 2002. We had to be up and running on March 1st with no impact operations. It was always looked to be an all hazard, you know, Homeland, Homeland Security organization. And as you've watched it mature over the last several years, one of the disappointing things that I've observed over the last couple of years is it almost turned into the immigration agency of, of the country. Now, quickly pivot to the immigration challenges that were on the border. You've seen that basically stop in the last mm -hmm. 10 weeks. Why? Because Title 42 was put in for the public health clause where you can actually return somebody immediately to the border of, of the country they came in from. So that happens frequently now on the border with Mexico. But people started to realize they weren't gonna be able to get safe passage into the country and the consequences of that have now put in place. So the numbers have basically dropped off entirely. Plus some people didn't wanna come here and perhaps be infected by the virus with their families. But my point is DHS, and I have the tremendous respect for the leadership and all the men and women who work at various levels in the organization, they've gotta be able to manage multiple risks. Is again, that all hazards function. So yes, it's pandemic today. Yes, it was immigration challenges over the last year and a half to two years. We're in the midst of hurricane season going forward, but who knows what's gonna be the next threat of domestic terror happening in the country or international terror. You cannot take your eye off the entire landscape of risk that faces a Homeland Security Department and its component agencies like DHS. And the same thing for businesses. You can't just focus on a single aspect of risk and think others will take care of themselves. It doesn't happen that way. And when you do, the consequences are greater. Yeah, that's great, Commissioner. You know, it's uh, more like DHS and certainly businesses these days need to be more like a multi-tool, not just a screwdriver, right? You got to have multiple tools to address any number of risks that are out there. And I think whether it be Homeland Security Enterprise writ large is responsible for this from a federal government standpoint or businesses themselves, you have to look across that risk landscape and be able to plan for each one of these possibilities. And the fact that we're in the middle of this COVID uh, crisis. And at the same time, you know, we're seeing hurricanes. The secretary mentioned uh, Bangladesh and dealing with that. There's a lot of things that can come together at once to create real problems uh, for all of us. And Mr. Secretary, I'd like to ask something that I know you've uh, spoke a lot about, and it's not exactly in the, the realm of business planning going forward, but the idea of elections and looking ahead a little bit. You know, what are your thoughts on, you know, thinking about an election that's coming up not in the sense of the political nature of it, but ensuring that people have the right and, and can get out to vote and all the conversations we've been seeing going on uh, relative to that. Look, I think that, you know, um, most people who've been looking at this understand that the best solution is one that gives people a broad right to vote absentee. So what you would do is you'd start now to build the capability to mail people applications for mail-in voting and they get the ballots and they mail it in. You could also create a kind of drop-by voting stations 
in a lot of different locations in a particular area. So people don't have to line up and congregate in a few schools, but they can maybe go to a shopping center and there'll be somebody there with a receptacle that can check you in and receive a vote. The key is to give people multiple different opportunities to vote and to do it in advance and to do it by mail. The one thing I would not do, by the way, is I would not have um, online voting, which creates a whole different set of issues about the security of the voting itself. But paper ballots are, to be honest, very secure. And the idea that there's going to be widespread fraud has never been proven in reality. You get occasionally you get a, a, a couple of isolated instances of fraud, but nothing all that significant. That is the safest and most reliable way to make sure everybody gets to have their say as a part of democracy. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I know that's been a, a topic of real importance to you, uh, looking at election security going forward. I've got a couple questions that came in, so I, maybe I'll go to those questions for a couple minutes here. Um, and and uh, Commissioner, maybe start with you. Um, it, what is it going to take going forward for this, to, and I hate to use the words return to normal, but is, is it going to be the vaccine? Is that going to be the panacea, if you will, that's going to kind of bridge us into you know being back where we were so to speak at least in terms of normal operations what are your views on that going forward yeah I, I i can tell you that that's a question best answered by the health professionals but i can tell you just from a a citizen standpoint when you see the impact of the discussion around a vaccine even using the stock market as one indicator when there's a positive conversation the s p and the dow go up exponentially when all of a sudden it seems there's a set setback it goes down exponentially as well. So obviously the vaccine is going to be a critical point. And as we've seen with various types of viruses over the years, until we actually are able to get people inoculated in the in, in advance of it hitting, you're going to have the threat and the risk and the impact. So obviously a vaccine is going to be critically important. I think we all hope that it's going to happen sooner rather than later. I think there's optimism it could happen by the end of this year, early next year. But again, that's the medical professionals. But I think the key point for people is you can't wait, you can't assume that that's going to happen and that's going to be the cure-all because there's a lot of yardage between now and then that people still need to be doing the right thing about putting the right plan in place with the right PPE in place, with the right hygiene, with the right practices and protocols and having the right implementation of a strategic plan and some level of governance and oversight because you just can't wait and say vaccine is going to take care of it when that happens if in fact it happens later this year. I'm confident the smart minds around the world in the health professionals area arenas will find a vaccine. There's no doubt at some point, but it's a matter of when. And the time between now and then, people need to not waste their time and they need to focus on what are the things I can do now to mitigate the number of impacted individuals who can add to the cases and potentially add to the number of deaths that we've seen. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, another question, uh, maybe Mr. Secretary, um, and, and you touched on this, I think, when we said your initial observations at the beginning, um, crisis communication, um, how important that has been and always is in terms of managing a contingency. What are some good examples you've seen? Are there countries, uh, are there businesses, are there elected officials that you've seen, maybe some good examples of crisis communication in this, uh, this particular instance, or even ones that you've seen previously? Well, I, I think uh, it is critical operationally, particularly if you're trying to affect behavior uh, um, in a population, to be clear, to be transparent, uh, not to be alarmist, but to make impress people with the seriousness of the issue and to give clear guidance. And I think we've seen um, some good examples in the U.S. Um, I, you know, I, I watched the mayor do her presentation uh, today, which I was part of, was a reopened DC. I think she was very clear and um, sympathetic, but also firm where she needed to be. Governor Cuomo's done a good job. Governor DeWine has done a good job in terms of being clear and communicating <laughs> regularly. Um, <clears throat> the most important thing you can have is credibility. If you are wavering, if you're reversing course, if you're over promising and under delivering, it doesn't take long for people to figure out you're not reliable. And once you've given up your credibility uh, on matters that met, that are life and death, it's hard to get it back. 
Yeah, we're back to that topic of trust, Mr. Secretary, without question. And uh, I think that's the undergirding of that. And uh, Commissioner, your thoughts as well? I, I'll tell you, uh, not necessarily in the crisis communication mode, but communicate, communicate, communicate is one of the essential messages that I think that organizations, not just in the public sector, need to be thinking about. Those in the private sector certainly as well. CEO level, executive level, at every organizational component, leadership level of an organization. In times like this, you need to have a solid communication plan. There needs to be consistency in the theme of that plan from every leader, from one to the other at various levels of the organizations. And as we found, we were actually setting up DHS. Again, it's change management. And anytime you're going through significant change management, you cannot communicate enough to people because people are starving for information. And guess what? If leadership does not provide information to people on a consistent basis and an accurate basis, people are going to make it up. People are going to get information from wrong sources. They're going to go ahead and give you anecdote and not factual information. And that's going to become the narrative. And you don't want that happening in an organization because it can yeah, unravel the way, very quickly. Yeah, by the way, I'd say that this is uh, you know, frankly more challenging now than when we were in government because the proliferation of social media platforms that have become vectors for disinformation, both launched from uh, geopolitical rivals, but also, frankly, from people who are ideological agendas domestically, um, that has taken off. And there's all kinds of stuff floating around now about, about the um, virus. It's total misinformation. And if you're not clear and reliable as a government leader, you're defaulting to those sources of information in a way that can really cause damage. That's great uh, from for both. We could probably have an entire session where you all could cover uh, communication and, and the importance, especially in today's day and age of social media. I'm sensitive to the time here, and I, I want to give uh, each of you uh, at least a minute or two to kind of provide some closing thoughts on this. Um, and to wrap up, uh, what keeps you up at night, Mr. Secretary, over the course of the next several months? Uh, what kinds of things uh, do you think businesses should be focused on going forward? I think that um, this is obviously economically and psychologically wearing. And um, one of the things I've said, and I wrote a piece about this um, about a month or so ago um, in USA Today, uh, one of the hardest things to explain and to execute is risk management and understanding that's not risk elimination. We're not going to make it so that nobody ever gets sick again. Uh, and life has never been like that. The question is, how do you balance reducing the amount of sickness and certainly staying within your the limits of your health um, uh, capacity, uh, you know, as institutionally? How do you balance that with the need to make sure people can earn a living and they do have some psychological relief from being locked down? Getting that right is challenging, and it's been made more difficult here by the fact that we don't know when this ends. We don't know whether the summer causes a real abatement or not. We don't know about a second wave. We don't know how soon there'll be a vaccine. So it's not like we can say to people, okay, well, flu season will be over in May or June, and then we can take a breather. And that uncertainty is very difficult. So I think the key is to, without compromising safety, accelerate what we can to find ways to develop therapeutics and a vaccine, but also prepare people for the fact that there will be waxing and waning of this, and we have to build resilience in our businesses so that we can adapt to telework if necessary, to remote delivery of products and goods if we have to go back to that, um, and to try to build investments that can be adaptable in the future. Hey, Commissioner, any closing thought from you? We've got uh, about a minute or so. Yeah, no, I think the Secretary made some great points, and I won't try to go ahead and underscore any of those. I agree with all of those 110%. But the biggest thing that concerns me going forward is that people just focus on a single aspect of risk. And we've talked about this previously, that people think as though that it's, this is where I need to spend my time. And as we've seen with very adaptable adversaries that we've dealt with over the years in Homeland and Border Security, they prey upon your weakness. And if they think you're focused just on one aspect of your game, they will exploit that and look at your weaknesses to be able to go ahead and whether it's introduction of a shipment of 
narcotics or, or introduction of a terrorist or not being prepared for a hurricane or some other natural disaster or some kind of act of domestic terrorism. We need to make sure as a community at the federal level, state level, and certainly in industry, making sure that we're all focused on the whole risk frontier to make sure that we're not just focused on a single aspect. Because when you do, you find out very quickly, you wish you had actually looked at the entire risk landscape because it can bite you very, very quickly. So it's a big challenge, but I think that clearly people need to focus on that entire aspect of it. Thank you both gentlemen, and thank you all for participating in today's webinar. We hope the discussion provides helpful insights that you can apply to your organizational risk management thinking. And finally, Chertoff Group has stood shoulder to shoulder with our clients during the COVID pandemic. And if there's anything we can do to facilitate your planning, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you again.